Hey, this is Web Free Talks. The rule of this podcast is simple. We only talk with people who have hands-on web free building experience. So if you are a hacker, entrepreneur, or investor, you can get inspired by their stories, lessons, and fuck ups. My name is Mac and I'm hosting this pod. If you want to stay in touch, go to twitter.com slash webfreetalks, click the link in the pinned tweet and join our Discord community. Let's go. Before we start this episode, a quick reminder that we are partnering with Epic Web Free, which is organizing a conference on how to build and grow web free products. And their lineup is really strong. Among conference speakers are people responsible for product and growth in POAP, MakerDAO, Polygon, Uniswap, Gnosis, Ledger, Metamask, Decentraland, and many, many more. During the event, there will also be a startup pitch competition, speed consultations with web-free experts, and one-on-one networking sessions with investors. Everything will happen on the 9th of June in the sunny city of Lisbon in Portugal. I will be at the event moderating some panels. So if you want to meet up in real life, it will be a good opportunity to do it. This partnership wouldn't be possible without you. So I organize a discount for all our listeners. Just type in Web Free Talks code at the checkout and you will get 15% off your tickets. Go to epicwebfree.com to learn more about the event. So today's guest is Alex Salnikov, co-founder of Rarible. And of course, most of you know Rarible as a popular NFT marketplace that's very creator focused, especially lately when there's a lot of conversation about royalties. And we'll definitely talk about that. But also what Rarible does is they let communities create their own marketplaces. So if you have your own NFT collection, instead of giving your fees to OpenSea, you can just have your own platform, have your own UX, your own design, and have something that's really very close to the vibe of your NFT collection. And also what Rarible does is they have Rarible protocol that helps NFT creators to build more interesting stuff in this whole space. So Alex, like there's a lot to unpack and you have been in in crypto for quite a while, at least two bear markets uh, already. So could you tell us like what chain of events led you to work on Rarible? It's a great question. First of all, thank you for having me here today. And I'm excited to talk more in depth because we've done a lot of things and a lot of them are subtle. And it's really nice to discuss them in a, in a focused environment with focused listeners. So as of the chain of events, it dates to 2012 when I just entered the crypto, but that might be too long to cover. I'll just briefly say that during that time, I was building exchange products and Rarible is an exchange product as well. So that contributes somehow to what we're doing. And it's just back then you couldn't do anything else. There was only crypto that you can exchange, but all these notions of liquidity, security, uh, frankly, just trading always excited me. Just sell something, buy something. It is, it is what gives you opportunity, opportunity to earn money anywhere in the world and to use your brain to leverage so that I feel trading gives intellectual people an ability to express themselves in a financial way. And I find this brilliant. So that category always excited me. We were doing multiple products in 2017 after the ICO craze and everything was so noisy. I even stopped following the news for a little. And then in 2018, 2019, I was getting back to research the space and I found out that there is a lot of infrastructure now. In 2017, you needed to have MIST, add your smart contract into MIST, wait for the synchronization, and that was crazy. In, in 2018, 2019, you had MetaMask, you had Portmatic that allows you to do a non custodial wallet with email and password. There was on ramp with wire with other players, there was even collectible step inside every wallet. 
and the collectible stab was empty. So I played with all that. I played with Compound. I played with Aave. I played with DeFi. And the sense of ownership that is given to you in all this ecosystem is just massive. You always know that if something goes wrong, you can use another lending platform. This lending platform doesn't cost you your money. It cannot go bankrupt. It might be hacked, but you don't need to trust it. If you don't like the wallet, you can change the wallet. If you don't like the on-ramp, you can change the on-ramp. So the feeling of empowerment of using all that ecosystem led me to the desire to create something else in that ecosystem as well that would give the user the same sense of empowerment over the things that they own and that they use. And NFTs was a very like nascent area that we all knew about it. Okay, crypto kitties and all that. And it also felt like the space is a little bit more ready for some consumers. So that's why I met during 2017, I met with Alexei and Alexei previous project was a sticker marketplace. So he had this notion that people are ready to pay for pictures. And I'm a good friend with our head of design. And we created several NFTs with him. And he is the big culture guy. He He's into skateboarding and NBA and just culture. And, and he, we created the, an, an NFT of a skateboard deck. We traded it back and forth a couple of times. And it just, it just clicked. It felt great. It felt great that I own the item. I can open it in every wallet. It will look the same. And blockchain makes it interoperable. And because of that, it now feels that it's not a record on the blockchain, but it's an actual item that I own. The same way I own something in the physical space. And that is massive. Whenever somebody gets that into Web3, they get converted and they fell down the rabbit hole. That's the chain of event. Yeah, I, I remember myself when I connected to OpenSea and, and, and seen my NFTs and then connected to, I think it was Ferrari Bull actually. And I've seen the same NFTs and I was like, huh? So they are not in the database of this app. They are on a blockchain and like although i know it theoretically when, when you first notice that it, it's very magical i definitely get that feeling and i'm wondering you know what are the early days of variable like what was your prototype your mvp and you know how it looked like i remember this specifically and big kudos to alexi we were sitting in a restaurant and, and brainstorming on what we should do I'm a product person by soul and always had these vague ideas about something can be created. And Alexi was pushing us right there in the restaurant in the first day. Like, let's get into the specifics. I said, okay, let's create a form to create an NFT. He was, okay, what are the actual fields of that form should be? And we created this actual fields on the napkin in the restaurant. And that is the big advice that I would tell the other builders. It's very easy to think that you know something and you usually have a vague idea that you know something and then the brain protects this idea from yourself and the brain tells you, okay, it's enough. You can move on. We know it. Instead of actually going deeper and understanding how, how does it exactly work? What is going to be the field? is the field number one, field number two, field number three, and there is a button and you click that button and you see the results. And you need to get to that level of understanding at least to build a product. So that, that three fields was name, description, picture, and the map of properties, arbitrary key value properties of this NFT, like size, M, year, 2022. And the button create, that prompts you to connect your wallet and then send a transaction to the blockchain and you need to have several transactions. So it was like one, two, three, four, four transactions applied to Pinata, call this smart contract. And then, okay, it was creating an NFT in the shared variable smart contract, not creating your own smart contract at first, but just in one shared variable smart contract. And a separate page 
that would be just a time sorted feed of all NFTs that are created with that tool. It was a discovery page. And that discovery page was living for a long time on variable since then. And now it's not there anymore, but that was the big fun and the big gist of the of browsing variable. You have this feed, this endless feed of creativity. Mm -hmm. And which year what was it? It was 2019, 2019 November. So it was like just before this NFT craze. We had a good half a year before the NFT art market started to pop. Mm -hmm. And like how you acquired your first users? Because you, you have this form that you can create an NFT. You have the feed. But like, who were your first users and how have you found them? Because NFTs back then weren't as popular as they are now, of course. This is, again, big kudos to Ilya. We spent a good amount of effort to make this website sleek. We were proud of it. It was very important because when you are proud of your product, it empowers you to go and market it hand by hand. It's not that I have some clunky prototype, but I have a very clean page Every word on it makes something, makes some sense. And it, it's beautiful. It's very clean, like Apple style. And Ilya, once we reached that goal, and Ilya, he is deep in the culture, he went on Twitter and he started DMing artists like, oh, check out this page. Some, some modern artists, check out this page. You can create your digital art here into NFTs. And then he started to retweet and tweet the best content that was created. And that formed the special Twitter feed that was very interesting to follow. Like, oh, this is actually some curated, great content made by coolest artists in the space that are on the forefront of culture that are interesting. It's interesting to follow them. And creating art in form of NFT was an art in itself because this is what artists do. They experiment with the new concepts and NFT was a new concept. So just making a simple black box in the in form of NFT, it, it was it was an art. Puck, I think that was Puck, sold an empty pixel in the form of NFT. And just out of this example, you can get the idea of the energy that happened during that time in the spends. It's, it's a new concept. You experiment with what is possible with it. What is not? At some point, we added flexible royalties so you can actually set up from zero to 100% royalties just yourself. Puck, again, I think, created an NFT with 100% royalties. So every time it was sold, the seller didn't get anything, but it was sent back to the creator. And that NFT was called NFT not for trade. It isn't made for trading. So experimenting, bringing users by hand by just DMing them on Twitter and grasping attention from doing something really cool that, and powerful that you're proud of. You know, sometimes design is underappreciated. I, I kind of agree in a sense that, you know, you need to provide some tangible value to your users. But as you said, if you have great design, it's much easier to promote your product. It's just like if you have a nice school uniform, you will wear it proudly. And if your school uniform looks like shit, then you won't be happy to wear it. So it's, it's kind of similar. So, you know, I am wondering, like, what was hardest back then? Because, you know, it's 2019, 2020, more or less. What's the hardest thing to do? Is it more on a technical side or growth side or maybe some other? It's a good question. Somehow that particular year, it didn't feel hard. From November 2019 till the summer of 2020, it was like a hobby. We were doing things that we loved, designing. We were thinking about how to make it pixel perfect because of the just internal desire to do so. And we felt the hard was always the question like whether people need that or not. But we've seen some early traction. It was like $100 and $200. 
then $300. We were growing more or less like 2x months to months. And that gave us the idea that it, it is probably needed by people. It is probably needed by people. It, it, the chart was going up. And one of the things that we constantly asked ourselves was, is this market going to be big? Is this a toy that everybody would play and then forget? Or is that something substantial that will create a new, a new large market? Creator economy is, is, is big, but an art in a, like actual collectible art that you buy to have might not be that big. That was always on our mind. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, how many people own real art? Like very few, actually. Like few people go to galleries, few people buy real art. So when I seen this a retraction of art NFTs, I was like, but how many people will buy it if they don't even own it in the physical world? But, you know, of course I was proven wrong. So I'm wondering, you know, what happened in summer 2020 that you said that it, it, it changed and it became more challenging? In summer 2020, summer in May, so it's the last month of spring 2020, we had some collectors to adopt the platform and that swept, as we now say, it's, uh, swept the floor, just bought almost whole collections of some early wearable creators. Uh, there was Azinachi, famous like uh, African creator. There was Frenetic Void, very like abstractionist. It was a great style. They, we had the spike on our volume. And believe me or not, that spike was $30,000 a month. So, and that was, wow, that, that was five times bigger than ever before. And that gave us some, some validation. Yeah, interesting. Something is happening here. Something is happening here. And then the DeFi summer started. The compound launched their liquidity mining program. And just a couple of weeks later, we launched our liquidity mining program. We launched the token that supercharged the growth of the platform. Just everything blew up like crazy. Out of this 50,000 a month, 30,000 a month, we went to a million a month by September. There was a nice partnership with Y Insurance. It was Yorin. Yorin was the hottest project of that summer. They created an insurance product and they used NFT as that cover for insurance. And we made a partnership with them that brought DeFi people to NFT world. Before that, NFT collectors were on DeFi. And now DeFi guys came to the NFT world and they, they started trading just much more. They poured in a lot of capital. Hmm. You know, you made the decision to issue a token, which is... Pretty uncommon among the guests that I have. So it's very interesting because, you know, I'm wondering like how it changes the way you operate. Because when you have a token, obviously it's a different type of entity than, you know, just like a normal corporation. It changed some things. We were always crypto native and token made a ton of sense. It felt modern that you can have a say in the platform. You can have a stake in the platform, you can have exposure to the platform performance. And because you have exposure, you can be an advocate for that platform. So that all mechanics was very new. They were innovative and they were exciting for us. And this is where the first challenges started to come in. We weren't ready to operate in a decentralized environment. And there was a lot of early users who wanted to have a say in how the platform actually operates. But it wasn't possible before because the processes inside the company were structured that way that, oh, you actually can't really go and tell somebody that what to do. And it, the company started as a private company and the public company, the public DAOs, we still three years later, we are figuring out how, how the DAO should work. So we, we had an idea to launch the token to operate like a DAO, but not being able to operate like a DAO in the same time with operating like a private company was challenging. The community expected us to follow. And there was this disconnect between an well, actual vote to do something doesn't mean that it will be executed because Sometimes voting is easy and execution is hard. 
<laughs> yeah, true, true. Uh, yeah, I mean, like I, what I've seen from DAOs is that it's very hard to do it well. And I can imagine 2020 when everyone was much more ignorant about the subject. Everyone, I mean, not only you, but like whole space didn't know about different traps that you can fall into. I can imagine it must have been hard. So how have you managed to improve this process? Like, how does it look like now? Long story short, and this would be my advice to builders as well, to think about it earlier. But we had several... We had to develop these two things parallel to each other. We had to keep the company running as it is as a private company. And we had to advance the DAO side so that it is able to operate as a company, as operate on some level to be able to assume more and more ownership from the company. And there was three iterations. The first iteration was signaling, just, okay, let's vote and snapshot of where, where we should go. The big learning from that was voting easy and executing is hard and people expect that execution will be easy, as easy as voting. So there was a lot of things that were voted on that but weren't done and that created a lot of frustration and they talking community like, they're not, they're not done. So the second iteration of that was more like an actual DAO with the grants, working groups, people who can execute on the decisions. And the second iteration issue was it wasn't directed enough. It wasn't streamlined. It wasn't united by the same mission and umbrella. Everybody in the DAO came for something different. I want to do a project. I want to use variable protocol. I don't want to use variable protocol. I want to do something open source for the space. Or I want to do an investment fund. Oh, let's invest some funds. Oh, we actually can't do it. And there was like 40 people doing all sorts of different things in the DAO, going different directions without the single united goal. The same issue, we had the multi-sig with some holders. And these holders... It felt still somewhat centralized. There was a snapshot vote, and some of them were not executed with the multi stakeholders. Same issue. And now the third iteration, uh, it's live right now, it's Rarity.foundation. It's an actual DAO, fully on-chain, with a robust governance process, which is written how to actually create proposals, with a threshold to propose to make a proposal, with the values and the goal outlined, and we're taking much more narrow approach, it's much more smaller contributor size, making sure that the contributors are vetted, aligned with the goal before they can start doing something. Make sure that everybody is on the same page, because if not, it quite quickly degrades into running around. Just a short break to remind you that if you like this podcast, please don't hesitate to subscribe and give it a five-star review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever platform you use. Thanks a lot. The most important asset of smaller entity is focus. And when you lose that focus, then it's very hard to outmaneuver you know, big guys that might not be as focused as you, but they have bigger resources so they can afford to not be that focused. Uh, so, you know, speaking about big guys, you know, this NFT marketplace environment gets tough because, you know, there's like OpenSea, Blur, Luxrare, now Magic Eden is in Ethereum-based NFTs as well and so on. And I know that Rarible evolved since the early days. So what's your plan for competing in this NFT space? Because I know that today you don't only compete on the NFT marketplace side, but you are a much broader product offering. Yes, that was one of the challenges of the autumn 2020 when everything started to blow up. We had a clash in, inside our wearable community there was a group of people who started to trade CryptoPunks, wrapped CryptoPunks on Rarible and share the liquidity incentives. And ART was much a smaller segment than uh, this CryptoPunk traders. 
And they started to almost like have an argument with each other. The artists were, you guys have much better trading volumes and you're getting our share of incentives because the incentives are aligned to the trading volume. And we started as an art platform. And even in in the features, the artists wanted collaborations. Artists wanted to have auctions and traders wanted to have filters and leaderboards. So this challenge of having two different UX for two different markets led us to the idea that we don't want to limit ourselves to just picking one of these markets. We want to serve the Qual NFT community and we want to be as broad as possible. And we moved down to the infrastructure side. So we create, we started in winter 2021 to the winter 2022. We started to create 2020 to 2021. We started to create a variable protocol. It's an infrastructure product, open source, governed by community in the proper way, all we know from DeFi, to be able to build the next variable on top of that protocol, to be able to build the next OpenSea or Blur or Foundation that requires some different UX on top of that protocol. And that was a long road of having, of getting to the wide market. And the latest learning was, oh, it's still actually hard to build on the protocol level, even if you provide all the backend, because the front end stack is big. It just takes three, four months to build a marketplace, you know, even if you have trading, if even if you have indexing. And, and we created the front end product. And now we're finally well positioned to fulfill our dream. Like everybody can create a vertical marketplace for their collection or for their market segment, for PFPs, for art, using the protocol, using the open source version, and truly decentralized, governed by Rary. It is finally coming to fruition. And we have now 2,000 marketplaces that are built with the generator. And we have 13 partnerships that are built uh, by the variable team as a white label, as a more custom marketplaces for bigger clients, such as CryptoPunks V1, Pixel World, Wrecked Guy, MFers, all these guys have marketplace with us. And it's still quite early for the marketplace segment. You still need to advance the marketplace with marketing tools, with communication tools, with some community building tools to make the home because it's harder to get a network effect on the smaller niche than for the big marketplace. So this is our direction. It's an infrastructure. You can build a marketplace on top of that. You can build an app on top of that. You can use API and you you fostering the vertical best for games, best for art, best for just my community. This is the direction and this is the only competitive counter bet. Everybody's fighting over this market of we are going to be the big marketplace and everybody would trade at once coming to our website and being this one giant marketplace of everything. We have a differentiated view on, on the future of the NFT market. That's our strategy. So it, it kind of sounds as if, you know, OpenSea is like this Amazon and you're employing this like Shopify strategy, like, you know, providing tools for building your own shop in a sense. Yep, exactly like that. Exactly like that. So, you know, I'm wondering, like, how do you acquire these partners? Are these mostly the artists that have used Triable before? Or the people who use your this creator NFT marketplace creator tool, like maybe they someone else, like how they learn about this NFT marketplace creator. People who use generators, they are mostly the artists. They are mostly people who created their own contracts on Rarible before, and the bigger partnerships are done by just going outbound and in and serving inbound with our. BD team utilizing our brand. Here is we are in a good position that we are known as one of the best brands in the space. And that makes it easier to close deals. Like let's build a marketplace with variable that we have that brand to trust to get those type of clients uh, for the partnerships. And 
you know, as far as I know, you also have one feature that you highlight a lot regarding artists, and this, these are royalties. I know that you are very strong promoter of creators' royalties. So as far as I understand, it's like, it's one of the selling points for communities. Like, you know, you can enforce your royalties and, and keep them in your treasury or keep them in the artist's pocket, whatever works. So I am wondering, like, could you expand, you know, what's your take on, on royalties? Why have you taken this position? The royalties, when they were just created, it felt like an innovation. Oh, this is something that wasn't really possible in the traditional world. Oh, let's tax the transaction. This, this is not possible. So everybody was really excited about that. And in general, this Web3 thesis is about being sovereign, being in control of things, being in control of your items, being in control of your wallets and royalties. It is the same thesis of being in control of your revenue stream. It is when you grow from just the user who buys and sells into the user who produces things. And you're, you're the businessman at this point. You are the entrepreneur. You created the royalty stream for yourself. And if you get a success, that allows you to have a huge opportunity to get the financial freedom by utilizing this revenue stream. That's why we've been always supportive for royalties because this is what gives people the power to the next level power. You not just control your, your items that you own, but you control the, the stream of income. That's very powerful. At this point, the marketplaces are the ones that are enforcing the royalties. It's not possible to enforce royalties on chain. And marketplaces are enforcing that. And our answer to that is if you want to have control over your royalty stream, if you want to have control over your income stream, you should be your own marketplace. That perfectly aligns with our previous vision about verticalizing marketplace and having your own marketplaces. Create your own marketplace, be your own marketplace that enforces these royalties for yourself and don't be reliant. Take sovereignty to your hands. Mm -hmm. You know, what I like about royalties is they are kind of like anti rock pool incentive in the sense that if you have royalties, you want to keep the collection alive and facilitate the community because you'll just make money if people are trading your NFTs. And if you just create an NFT collection and disappear after promising that you'll create a video game, like, you know, a year ago, everyone was promising that. You just don't care about losing royalties because you would get 0% anyway. So the fact that you might get royalties, like, it's a very interesting uh, thing. So do you do anything more for royalties? Like, do you promote them among artists or like, you know, kind of like lobby the community? Because I, I, I think I've read your thread about royalties or maybe just one on the Rarible Twitter page. So like, do you also do some kind of like education for the market? At this point, we don't need to lobby for royalties or educate anyone. The market knows about royalties and the market is pushing marketplaces for royalties. So the only thing we need to do is just like listen to the market. We don't need to go outbound. Yeah, we just need to stand for, with the market. We need to protect what market wants from us. Mm -hmm. And when you run Rarible right now, when it's like more complicated product than it was two, three years ago, I'm wondering like what kind of metrics do you follow? Like what things do you take into account on daily, weekly, monthly basis? These can be either qualitative or quantitative metrics that you focus on? Yeah, that's a great question. For the trading business specifically, the main metric is GMV. You want to measure the volume that goes through your platform and you want to understand that people are actually making transactions. Everything else is the proxy metric to the GMV. How many people came to the marketplace? How many people connected their wallet? How many people added items to the card? Some, how many people listed an item? How much of the listed item you have as a supply? That's why we do aggregation, right? That was increasing the supply of the marketplace. This is the proxy metric to the GMB, to the actual transaction. And now with the new product of like 
create your own marketplace, we measure the same as well as the number of marketplaces and the metrics inside the marketplace, the new ones. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, like, because I can imagine that if I create a marketplace, like my own, I can imagine that the biggest challenge is providing liquidity because, you know, people are all over the place. So I'm wondering, like, how typically communities do it, how they take care of the liquidity on their own marketplaces? This is the biggest feature of our protocol and your marketplace. We are aggregating OpenSea, LuxRare, x 2 and Sunblur. So when you create a marketplace, it already has all the liquidity out there available on all the other marketplaces. So you don't need to care about your initial liquidity. Initially, there is all liquidity available out there. The next question that you want to solve is, oh, how do I incentivize people to list on my own market to gain this substantial market share of the native listings and not listings available on other marketplaces? And the biggest working approach for that is just engaging your community. We are building more tools to do this. So far, just going to persuade your community, like this is our marketplace, we have to stand for it. We should lease on our marketplace because it contributes to our treasury. It does better thing. So just doing marketing. But it's the hardest part, of course. And I guess you've seen tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands NFTs in your life. So I'm wondering, like, what are some of your favorite collections and what made them your favorite collections? I'm the big Doodle supporter and culture and aesthetic values and minimalism and community. I often connect with people who have Doodles. I connect with them online and they are usually product people or designers. There are people who care a lot about being coherent and elegant. And that was a big thing of supporting me. So I think every NFT has a community and this community has values. And usually that values resonate with the very image of that. So if you take board apes, they're rough, they're aggressive, they're bored and they're rich. <laughs> and this is what you see in the community of these people when they come to the event. They are a little aggressive, they're rough, they're rich, and they're bored. So it makes a ton of sense to me. I like MFRs. They're great because it's the people who are actually sitting at home and researching or building. I spent half of my 20s being this MFR, sitting in front of my computer with a cigarette. I quit smoking now, but just endless researching about the block, that, that would bring me to the MFR community. And there's many more like that. It just resonate. One of the latest was the Yolinx. Sadly, they're not performing as well, but they're minimal, they're 3D, they're innovative. That was my big thing for Yolinx. I like Ledger community. I have a Ledger market pass because it gives you utility and it is innovative. So innovation is a big value of mine. So probably those would be my choices. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you have spent, you know, almost four years building Rarible. So I'm wondering, like, what were the things that surprised you the most? Because you started with some initial set of hypotheses, some assumptions, but I bet that some of them have been proven wrong. And you learned that the world or the market works differently than you thought. So I'm wondering, like, what were these things? The biggest assumption proven wrong was for when NFTs happened as the movement, the spring 2021, full swing of bull run. Nifty Gateway is doing $100 million in sales, Bull is doing $50 million in sales, OpenSea is getting up the speed. We are account for a big market share. So there is a feeling that NFTs are here and uh, what's going to be next. And the next, we are just have will just have a massive influx of the new users. And let's build tools for the new users. And what is going to be that tools? It's going to be faster blockchains, gasless blockchains. We will build credit cards. We'll do login with email and password. And all of that was proven wrong. Even before we were able to build Flow 
and credit cards and log in with email and password. It took us like three, four months to do to build. It's not a crazy long time. But in three, three, four months, the hardcore audience of Ethereum, MetaMask, OpenSea, the people who were at the forefront of the culture, they educated their friends and their friends educated their friends. And if I heard about NFTs and I want to enter the space, I usually, and I don't know anything, I usually have a hardcore crypto people, a crypto person in my friend list who I'll ask, oh, what should I do? And he will tell me, go download MetaMask, learn how to do it. It's not hard. He will hold me by hand. He will explain me what the gas is and he'll onboard me to that type of culture and not the flow culture. So that was the biggest thing. And it's again an advice for the builders. You want to build for the current hardcore culture, but still to be open to the newcomers to learn. If you're building something very difficult for only hardcore people, that is like almost impossible to learn, that's going to be a big barrier. But you want to build something that is without compromising any quality of the hardcore people. You want to build something without compromising decentralization. You want to build something without compromising liquidity, without compromising their values, but still to be open to the newcomers. Yeah, I think it's spot on. Like all of my friends that went into NFTs, like some of them can hardly use apps on their iPhones, but they learned how to download MetaMask, download Phantom, create a Binance or Coinbase account, send money abroad, then just buy crypto, send it to wallet, connect wallet, create a transaction, pay the gas. And this is really astonishing that all of them actually learned it. And this is part of the fun. As a newcomer, I want to learn something before other people will learn it. I want to learn something difficult. I want to feel the alpha. If I come to the website that I log in with email and password and I buy an item there, it doesn't feel new. It doesn't feel like a future. It doesn't feel like I'm joining some revolutionary movement before the other people will join it later than me. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Like, like I remember when I first made my MetaMask transaction, I was like, yeah, I'm like a hacker now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, like this is it. Like, you, you feel that you're on the forefront and all your other friends that are more like normies, that you can answer their questions and can be like kind of like a guru for them, at least for until they learn how to use this stuff. And for some people, it might be very important. So Alex, like, if you are not building variable what would you build today it changes i have a lot of things yeah today it's like february 2023 (laughs) i would probably be excited about some social apps the faster blockchains will bring a new set of innovations to us so it will just allow the new type of use cases and one of these use cases will be games but cool games are also social. I spent thousands of hours of playing games, but only two of them, like Dota and Counter Strike, that I can play with my friends that are social. So things like Lens Protocol, DSO, Messengers, XMTP, NFTs, just a social profile, your identity, your wallet is your identity, your on chain games. Yeah, this kind of things are exciting to me. Yeah, I am also excited about games. Like I I haven't played games for a long time, but I spent just like thousands of hours playing games when I was younger. And for me, the games were always at the forefront of social in the sense that if you played games, for you, it's obvious that you spent time with people you never met and they are pseudonymous. And this is normal. And now we see it in, in social media, on Twitter, or are people who are pseudonymous and they have hundreds of thousands of followers and they build their online reputation. And also in games, we were buying digital goods, digital, you had to buy a magic sword or whatever. Sometimes you bought it with free money, sometimes you bought it with gold, and now you can do it with NFTs, which is like the next generation of, of that. 
that's the next thought to the builders. Don't be pocketed. Don't be boxed by the idea that games should be video games. I stumbled upon the essay by Pucky McCormick called The Great Online Game recently, and I overlooked it. It's back from 2021. But the definition of game is much wider. The Twitter where you put an NFT on your avatar is a game as well. So having an ownership in an online project, it is the part of the metaverse. I am the owner of something that exists only in the virtual world. And this is a serious, this is a serious game. It's not like a silly game. You can make your fortune or you can lose all your money playing that online game with the ownership of the online businesses. It's like a second life, but on the internet today. Don't think that, oh, if that's a game, then I should build something that I logged in and play with my computer and mouse and I, and I solve for quests. It's wider. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, there are many, many games, like the very non video game, but the traditional game indeed that I have in mind are the RPG games. You mean, I mean, like the ones with the game master, the old school ones that, that I play a lot with my friends. And I can imagine that you could have AI, like chat GPT like GMs that could walk you through different scenarios when you're playing with your friends and you could have an NFT license for these scenarios. So this is one of one of the ideas I have. And Alex, like if you had a magic wand and could fix one thing about Web3, what would you fix? It evolves. Some time ago, like a couple of weeks ago, I would maybe even answer that I would fix UX. Probably coordination. A lot of great things are invented, but they are taking too much time to implement because in order to implement them, you need multiple people to implement them at the same time. There is a new standard for wallets and you need to wait until 30 wallets would implement that. So just better coordination, better alignment on what we should actually build. Building account abstraction is probably one of the biggest desire of mine today to happen in Ethereum and across all tools and across all wallets and across all dApps at the same time. That would take year, years. And I wish that would happen faster. Okay. So Alex, where they can learn more about Trarable? If they want to learn about the platform and the protocol and everything that you do, where should they go? Yep. Come to Rarible Twitter, of course. And my own Twitter, sometimes I tweet. I tweet a lot about what a Rarible does and what Rarible is. It's one of the forefronts of what Rarible is doing today. It's down for the protocol and it does in a decentralized way with the governance. So that is, and there is a governance forum where you can read a lot of proposals that are in depth written about tokenomics and all that. That this would be a valuable resource for you. Okay. So Alex, we are getting till the end. So I have one last question. What other builders like you, people who co-founded some important projects in the space, do you think would be a good fit for the conversation that we had? Did you talk to Pedro from Wallet Connect yet? Yeah. Stanley would be great. Talking about Lens would be very interesting. And somebody from the Lens community. Okay. Okay. Yeah, th- they are definitely on my wish list, guest wish list. So I'm going to try to get someone from Lens. Okay. okay. Yeah. So Alex, like, thanks a lot. It was very interesting. And thanks for sharing the perspective of the of the early days of running a DAO, of the challenges that you had, because you are definitely writing a new chapter for Rarible right now. So I'm going to be curiously following do you ship right now and how your project is developing. Thank you so much. Yeah, there is a lot of things. We love innovation. We love building new things and we love seeing these things adopted. So thank you for having me. So this is almost the end. But if you like this episode and don't want to miss the next ones, feel free to subscribe. If you liked it a lot, I'd be personally grateful if you could give us a five-star review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever platform you use. Thanks to these ratings, more people can learn about Web3 Talks, and it's really important to me. That's all for today. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.